Welcome to Geocache Adventures with me, Shadow Dragon One, where I explore the world of geocaching. If you like the podcast, please consider leaving a five star review on Apple Podcast or the Geocache Adventures Facebook page. Or share it with somebody that you think would enjoy it. Word of mouth is a great way to spread the podcast. You can also join Geocache Adventures on Buy Me a Coffee. Just follow Geo Adventures, that's one word, G E O Adventures on Buy Me a Coffee and get behind the scenes on every episode or become a member to unlock other exclusive content. Hey everybody, Amy Shadow Dragon One here. Thank you for joining me for the continuation of my talk with Everse about geocaching and Latvia and New Zealand. So without further ado, here's the rest of that conversation. So there in New Zealand, um, same question about the associations. Have you had any experience with geocaching associations in New Zealand or heard of any groups that are trying to promote and organize it? So I think in that way, it's really similar to Latvia because it's a small country, not many geocachers. Again, uh, there's no regular mega events here, okay. although they... They used to do them, I think, from maybe like 2013 until 2018, maybe there was a mega each year. Okay. But uh, but again, it's it's a real mission to try and scrape those 500 people, those will attend logs. And because in New Zealand, it's not like the mega events that have been here. Because of those, the two islands and all that. Uh, so it's not an event, you know, they try to make an event, you know, one year it's in the one, one island, one year it's in the other island. And um, so it can't automatically get the status of mega. So it need, they need to do it every time in you. Okay. Because it's not a, you know, it's not an annual New Zealand mega event. It's every time it's different organizers, different place. So there's that. Um, well, we did just have a couple of geo tours, but both of them have ended now. Okay. And they were uh, they were put up by the Ministry of Education. So. Uh, but yeah, I don't think there's again. I don't think there's any kind of geocacher associations here. Yeah, it's just mostly individual cachers getting uh, you know getting together and uh, planning events. Okay. There's no, yeah, there's no really, yeah, there's kind of no promoting in that way to public, I don't think. Oh, well, there has, yeah, it's mostly been, which is, I find it really awesome that uh, I think most promoting of geocaching that has been done in New Zealand has been done through government, governmental departments or agencies like oh. these geotours, both of these geotours were done by the Ministry of Education. And they made quite a big thing out of them, and um, they were all over the country. And yeah, the, you know, you you went and found these tour caches, and then you got these code words from each cache. And then if you complete a region, you send away this completed form for the region, and you get a geocoin for each region. And you know, you can get them all, and then they give you send you a nice coin holder and all that. Okay. And uh, and you know, that was I think that was being promoted you know outside just geocaching.com that was being promoted through their channels and there's uh there's a department of conservation uh which they have also put out some geocaches uh, there's the wilderness huts where you stay and uh some of some of the geocaches around the huts were placed by doc the, the department of conversation conversation no conservation okay um so yeah, I think it's mostly mostly that. I don't, I haven't, I'm not aware of anything else that's, um, yeah, that's happened. And I think again, that could be to do with something with the with the, you know, that not to say that all geocaches here are old and you know, but um, it could be that you know most are. Uh, you know, there's lots of people who retire and then they go geocaching, you know, yeah. they find out about geocaching. And they're not going to be, they're not going to be the people who are, you know, they, they will be content with 
doing it themselves and they're not going to be the type of people who are going to be super social and uh, you know most events here are oh, that's another that's another uh, difference which i actually miss compared to latvia like the events here are 99 percent of the events here are in a cafe you sit down have a tea have a cake have dinner but it's it's at a bar it's at a cafe it's a okay. gathering to just sit basically okay. whereas in latvia most of the events somebody organizes something like a, you know kind of like a race like uh, you know you have to do stuff to actually log the event okay so more activity based there in latvia yes scavenger hunts um yeah and again younger people older people uh you know those those kind of things so you've noticed a very big demographic change between the two yeah yeah but having said that uh like hats off to all the older geocaches here who go you know go on hikes and uh yeah there's i personally know you know from these events i know you know people 60 plus people who some of them are more active than me like um <laughs> you know and that's a big difference culturally from Latvia, because in Latvia, when you retire, you're, you know, the stereotypical old Latvian is like a grumbling lady who is, uh, you know, sitting at home. She's sitting at her kitchen window in, in you know, like the gray looking Soviet apartment blocks buildings. Okay. She's sitting in the kitchen window and just looking down on the street and just like, unhappy look on her face and like judging all the people who are going outside uh you know obviously that's not true but it's it's that kind of like yeah it's the stereotype and also it's the standard of living like in latvia it's it is lower like the you know old people retired people especially because lots of those people worked in the soviet times and so they yeah they, they might not get pensions that are right. decent because of all that um, kind of being lost from those times so yeah they're kind of barely going by it's it's yeah a bit depressing sometimes whereas here retired people will be mostly well-off people you know having just bought a fancy camper van and uh, traveling around and being happy with their life that they don't have to work anymore and uh, you know yeah, I hadn't thought about that with Latvia being part of the former Soviet Union, how that yeah. loss of, you know, that previous culture affects the current culture yeah, yeah. so much. And, uh, yeah, and it just, it, it affects, yeah, the way people are, because, so I was born in Soviet Union, but I was only three years old when the Soviet Union collapsed. So, you know, I haven't really lived in Soviet Union. But um, you can see that, you know, like in my parents' generation, like there will be, you know, people don't smile as much. People are more, um, they just, yeah, you, because in Soviet times, you couldn't do that. Because if you go about smiling, like if you go about your day smiling in Soviet Union, your neighbor will look at you and he's like, well, he's hiding, you know, he's definitely hiding something, you know, mm -hmm. I want to, you know, like basically your neighbor will dub you in because, uh, you know, maybe you've, uh, you know, you find, you've found some ways to uh, somehow benefit from the system, you know, like, right. or, you know, you, so there's, there's a lot of that kind of distrust, I think, uh, especially in the older generations, like, um, yeah. Do you think because of that cultural difference between the generations that grew up in that Soviet Union era versus like your generation, younger generations that are removed from that, do you think maybe that has something to do what, with why so many of the geocachers there are of the younger generations? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think so, because... Um... If you ask, uh, and and yeah, it's an odd thing because I think, you know, in Latvia, those, you know, like kind of my parents' generation who will be the people who are kind of retiring now, um, 
you know, they just don't understand geocaching because uh, they're like, well, you know, it's like you know, it's kind of pointless. Well, you know, like they just think, you know, it's a silly thing to do, you know, because in, in, again, maybe when they were younger, they, they couldn't really do those things, like things like that. They couldn't do as many things as they wanted to do, maybe. You know, they just had to do a lot of things because they had to do them. And, and, and then in the opposite way in New Zealand, I've sometimes, I think um, I've encountered that the younger generation, uh, you know, if I tell them about geocaching, they're like, oh, you know, and, and, and you know, what do you get when you find geocaches, you know, <laughs> is, you know, is it, you know, you find 10 and then someone pays you, you know, like, you know, you get some rewards and they're like, well, no, you don't get anything you know you get the satisfaction you get the you know adventure and they're like huh you know no nah, i'm not interested in that that's interesting um yeah yeah so it's a uh, yeah it's a yeah it's a that's that's the thing yeah, about the different how different cultures reflect into the different things but yeah i mean that's still one of the things in geocaching that you know the one of the things while while why i've stuck with it for so long because I tend to get bored of hobbies and you know geocaching I've done for 15 years now and still doing it is that it's just so diverse you know there's gonna be there's gonna be old people young people there's gonna be engineers there's gonna be uh you know all kinds of professions yeah people from all walks of life doing it and that means all the caches will be really yeah it's gonna be a multitude of different things and you know you can find your find your own things that you like. That's very true. Um, they are in New Zealand. Are there a lot of preform containers there, like in Latvia, or do you see a different type of favorite or common container? Um, I heard uh, I heard your um, episode where you talked with the Jagashing Down Under. Yes, from Australia. And I mentioned uh, those mint the mint tins. Is that is that the same? The mint tins. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, there's even uh, so near Christchurch where I live. There's a whole uh, mint. So the I, I don't know if they was are they the same in Australia, but they're called Eclipse mints. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's just this. Uh, uh, again, I probably have some. I probably have one of those containers somewhere lying around here, but. Uh, um, and uh yeah so it's 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 not a good geocaching container for starters like it's i don't know why it's i guess it was just an abundant type of container that was thing around you can get, yeah and then people started hiding them but they get rusty they get uh, they're not watertight at all um but yeah, there's whole series, there's whole geocaching series with those mint tins. And there's one near Christchurch where the geo, it's a geo art one and the geo art says Eclipse <laughs> uh, on the map. And it's about, it's, I think it's 81, 81 caches and each is dedicated to like a language. So each, each like to get the coordinates, uh, it will just be in a, uh, you know, the numbers are going to be written out in words in a different language. Oh. So there's 80, 81 languages. You just have to put it in Google Translate. And it doesn't always work. Sometimes it will, you know, give you weird results. And then yeah. you kind of have to pick out like these little parts and translate each word individually because otherwise, in a sentence, it doesn't make like a nice number string. Okay. But yeah. They are, and I mean, I have hidden a couple as well, uh, but uh, they're good as a magnetic one if you put it under like a guardrail or something where okay. the water doesn't get into it, then it's good because it stays dry. But yeah, if it's hidden, you know, on the ground by a fence post, you know, it's going to be inevitably in a year's time, it's just going to be like a mushy logbook inside it and uh, it's going to be rusty. Yeah. But you know. If you're good and with the, doing maintenance in your caches, and there's a couple of those GeoArt series close to Christchurch where they are all those Eclipse Mint containers, and the cache owners actually religiously maintain them. I don't know how they do them. They have like hidden hundreds of caches, 
and uh, I was just telling you how I got last month. We we drove out and did one of those series, and um, there were two that we DNF'd because they were gone. And I think it was only like a week later. And and those those cash owners they don't even live in town. They live on the west coast, I think. And uh, you know, like a week later, they were like, "Yep, we replaced the caches." Wow. So yeah, it's nice if, when they're maintained. Know, if you're onto it, then uh, then yeah, then there's no problems with it. But it's just yeah, it's mostly when when they don't get maintained, then yeah, they just get nasty. Yeah. But I think that is the most popular. And then again, the second most popular is probably the those lock and lock. Okay. Which are called uh, I think it was the same in Australia. They they're called Systema containers because the company that makes them is called Systema. Yeah. And uh, so that's why those launch boxes are called. And uh, and I think the difference from the lock and lock ones is because on lock and lock the clips are on the lid, right? Yes. Yeah, the ones we the system like, containers yeah. have the clips on the container itself, not on the lid. Okay. And because on and and that's a that's actually a major update from the lock and locks because they held onto the container here with like a kind of hinge type of system. Whereas on lock and lock, it's like a flexible plastic, um, like it's like a flexible plastic, right? Yeah. It's like, and so that wears down and, you know, yeah. you know, after some years, the little clip will just break off. Yeah. Whereas here, it's like a hinge that's uh, like a, yeah, like a moving part. Obviously, it can also break, but it's less prone to breakage. than. It uh, doesn't have the same uh, wear and, and strain breakdown that yeah. the lock and locks do. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. But, you know, like always, water finds its way everywhere oh so, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah water will find a way yeah yeah and it mostly it mostly depends on how often a geocache is found because i found some really lonely caches in new zealand mm -hmm. and uh, it's some like a basic container that's been sitting out there for 10 years and no one's found it uh for 10 years and it's in a perfect condition because you know there's just haven't been people closing and opening that the seals the haven't worn and it stays tight yeah. Yeah. yeah so of all of these countries that you have geocached in what would you say in your opinion has the most unique geocaching culture yeah it's an interesting question um I think it's it's there's these unique things. I don't I don't think I I can say that yes, you know, this country definitely has the most unique geocaching culture because there's, you know, these geocaches, blah blah blah. But there's just these little things that are unique to a culture and that kind of really st have stuck in my memory. And there's I'll just mention a few. Um there's well, for example, yeah, Latvia with the terrain ratings, yeah, and uh, and that kind of demographic, the, and the bridges, uh, the under the bridge caches, that was one thing, and then there's um, there's Germany in Europe, which has, I think, I I think they probably have the most dedicated geocachers, I would say, in the world, because just because the cache density is insane there and you know they have all the giga events and all that yeah and uh, and it's a different level i've been to a mega event in germany that was before you know before giga events were have, had been a thing but uh yeah my first mega event i went to was in germany in 2010 i think and yeah i was just completely kind of yeah dumbfounded like completely shocked at the scale of the event and that was 2010 so that was you know but in latvia you know we had these little tiny events with 15 people and then suddenly you go to this event and there's more than thousand people there uh, i think it was probably like three thousand or something and uh they have these all these sub events it's a whole thing with you know catering and yeah you know porta potties and 
like it's a whole you know it's kind of like a it's like um you know a little village um and they just yeah the dedication that you know they had events for everything they had uh like I, I remember there's one event which was called the terrain five event okay. and uh so I, I, I met this one German geocacher once in Latvia and he, you know, we kind of went to some caches in Latvia together and then blah, blah, blah. He invited, later he invited me and another geocacher to, you know, come visit him in Germany and go to that mega event. And he's like, um, you know, he's a kind of mountaineer climbing, you know, a rock climbing guy. And, you know, so he has all the gear and everything and he knows, you know, all, all, all about that, but, Whereas, you know, we didn't really know much about it, but we went to this event and it was like a full on, like to log on, log the event, you basically went through like a full on mountain rescue test kind of thing. Like, you know, it was all rigged up in this abandoned building with all these ropes. And then you had like a, you know, you had like a dummy human body lying down in this basement, like through where the floor has fallen through and everything. And then you know, you had to figure out by just, you know, like you had these ropes and, and the climbing gear and you had to like figure out how to like, you know, say that person's broke, you know, he's fallen down there, broken his back or something. And then just kind of as safe as you can, like lift him out. And uh, yeah, and that was all part of an event. Wow. And that was kind of, you know, you you went through all this to actually log the event. That's wild. Like, yeah, it's just that, yeah, I've never seen that kind of level of, uh, and there was another sub event there, which was an underwater event where you, there was, they had a pool, which was uh, something like six, six meters deep pool. And okay. they had a uh, waterproof marker at the bottom of it. And so to log it, you dive down in the pool and sign the, sign the logbook wow. underwater um yeah you know just stuff like that it's like a dedication to geocaching uh, that i haven't i think I, I think i haven't seen since and then there's czech republic with their unique i don't know if you've ever encountered these wooden geocoins i've seen pictures those. i've seen pictures of they're them not, online they're not trackable they're like yeah. path tags in a way that you know, then don't have an individual tracking number, but they're wooden and just laser engraved. So they're really cheap to make. And they, you know, the individual geocaches will they just like mint, you know, like a thousand of them for themselves. And then they will exchange them. And I went to this Geocoin Fest event in Czech Republic some years uh, after that German mega event. And and they had all these sub events for the wood geocoins and they literally would have like, you know, someone walks up with this big suitcase and then they, they open the suitcase and it's like these whole like sheets, um, you know, kind of like you would imagine like stamp collectors with their albums and little like the transparent sheets okay. with all the stamps yeah. in them. But there was like a suitcase with sheets and the, the sheets had those ge wooden geocoins in them and, you know, then they lay them out and like, exchange and trade them wow so i think yeah czech republic and germany in europe they are the most dedicated uh, kind of geocaching countries um, that's pretty neat yeah yeah there's like heaps heaps of geocachers and um yeah um so yeah i think that's uh there's i really like there was um in finland there was a cache series it's mostly archived now i just looked them up today and unfortunately yeah they, most of them are archived but there's a cache series dedicated to caching culture oh and so there would be so I just have that list up there now and so say they they had a and they have one dedicated to latvia and um which was about the terrain so it was cache culture terrain two stars latvia and uh, so the geocache was up in a pine tree, but you have to <laughs> climb up, and it's it's only two stars. That's or funny. they had this nano um, cache culture, nano in Azor, Az Azores, Azor. How do you say? It? Yeah. Anyway, like these islands in Portugal, and it was uh, so it's called nano, but it was actually like a 
decent sized pill bottle and uh you know for they said for some reason they've been to you know they've been to this particular region in portugal and you know all the cash description says it's a nano but then they're finding these big magnetic pill bottles and uh so they kind of made yeah they made a series that not not many of them there was um Oh, I actually maybe you might be able to tell because I've found a couple of them, but I didn't find all of them. And so they have one that's called Palatka style Norway. And I I have no idea what the Palatka style cache is. And the description says that uh, the story behind the name is that a Norwegian couple had been on a holiday in Florida and geocaching in the town of Palatka. And there they saw this kind of container and introduced it in Norway. And since then it's been called a Palatka cache. But I haven't found that particular one. So I, I don't actually know what that container looks mm, like. I'm not I don't sure. Know. You've randomly heard about this town in Florida that has a unique cache type, you know, co container type. No, I, I haven't. I'm thinking of the the common container types that I'm, I'm used to in the States. And um, I don't know if maybe they just not knowing, you know, how, how much in the U S they had geocached, if they, it's just something that's very common yeah. here that they hadn't encountered. Yeah. They just probably saw something in a town that was probably, you know, cache is hidden by a one particular cache hider. And then, you know, how yeah. each cache hider will have like a kind of, their own signature type of, you know, hiding. And I probably saw that, but yeah, I just, I just found that it was like a kind of really cool idea about uh, making, making a cash series. And oh yeah, and, and one to also the last one to note from that was the, the Germany one, which was, uh, it was called Eine Kleine Multicache, which means a small multicache. Okay. And it's literally, so that, multi cache that was hidden for the cache culture it literally had 11 points and it's called a small multi cache because that's the one thing the germans also are really crazy about are the multi caches and uh yeah again you know somebody comes because in new zealand most of our multi caches are like a single you know you go to like a plaque you read some numbers you put them in the formula and you get the coordinates and that's it Someone from New Zealand will go to Germany and then they see, oh, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll do a multi cache. And then, you know, three hours later <laughs> and like 15 yeah, waypoints later. That's that's one thing here uh, in the US. I, I've seen multis that range from all levels. You know, uh, like you said, the you go to one and do a projection or just you know go to another single point so at most you have two stages mm -hmm. that you go to to there's in new york city in central park there's a multi-cache that takes you to every single bridge in that park and i forget the yeah. exact number but it's over 20 locations uh -huh. for this one multi-cache yeah, yeah. Yeah, ninety percent in New Zealand here, they will all just be like a single, yeah, either a projection or yeah, you just visit one point, read some information there, get the numbers. There are some longer multis as well, obviously, but there, um, yeah, just a few, few in between. Of all the countries that you've geocached in, do you have a favorite? Um, yeah, I think that's again like it's kind of like a rigged question. Um, <laughs> I know, <laughs> but there is actually there is one country that comes in mind. Well, yeah, and I think again I won't say Latvia or New Zealand because I mean I've seen and found so many good caches, but then again I've also found a lot of you know a lot of eclipse containers and a lot of film canisters, micros in the woods because just because I have found over 3000 caches in each country yeah. obviously there's going to be lots of really good ones but you know more of uh, you know average ones but there is uh, a country that comes in mind is Estonia which is uh, just a neighboring country um, next to Latvia and I've 
that's one of the countries I've also found, because if I look at my stats, I have New Zealand in first place, Latvia, Lithuania, and then Estonia with 127 countries found. But I found some really, like out of those 127, I would say there were a lot of them that were really, you know, really well done. Like um, there's this one small town called Tartu, in Estonia, and that had there were lots of gadget caches around there. Oh, okay. And I think those are some those are the most unique caches I've ever found. Um, there's been and and they were all so they were all traditionals, but in a sense they're actually like a mystery because you can't just you know you find the cache that's like the least uh, uh, that you need to do, but you need to get to the logbook. And to open the container, it's sometimes you need to figure like, yeah, there's one that I really liked was called, um, I think it was called 160 MH. And that was all, there was nothing in the description. It was just said 160 MH. Okay. And uh, you go to ground zero and you have this obvious big concrete block with a little door on it. And a single tiny, you know, those LCD displays that are just like a monochrome can just display numbers, yeah. right? Like it can only display two numbers. And there's a single button on the door. There's no handle. There's nothing to like, it's like a seamless flat door okay. with no, no way to kind of grab onto it to open it. And then you start thinking, you know, well, the cache name is 160 MH. It doesn't really ring, you know, ring any bells. So you try to press the button. If you just press the button, like the little display just kind of has some activity, but nothing really happens. Then you hold the button and then you let it go and it displays a number on it. Okay. And then, and then you kind of, and by that time you probably figure out, well, the longer I hold the button, the bigger the number I get. So probably I need to get 160 on it. Or maybe it was 80, actually, because I think it was only two numbers. Yeah, I think it was uh, 80. But then you still don't know, because then the next thing you do is you time. So, you know, okay, maybe I'll hold the button for 80 seconds. So you hold the button for 80 seconds, you let it go, and it shows something like 12. And then... Um, so I, I don't know if you if, if you're trying to figure it out in your head at the moment, but I mean I can tell you uh, what's uh, so the M H is the is that's the key. Okay. I don't know. Do you do you want to think about it or should I just tell you? I'm trying to think of what if M H stands for something or if it's it's, l it's also lowercase. Lowercase. M H. Okay. Yeah. So you think it's probably a unit of yeah, measurement of time, Yeah, I'm trying to think time, what, kind right? of, what kind of unit that would be, because I'm familiar with milliseconds, but that would be MS. I'm not sure. Okay, you're going to have to clue me in here. <laughs> so H is hours, right? Yeah, okay. But and M, M is milli. I've never so heard of So milli hours. It is not a real unit I was gonna of say, measurement I've of time. Never heard of that. Because you know, minutes like hours and minutes, it's the you know, it's the sixty base. It's not a hundred. Yeah. You know, like a standard. So, a milli hour would be, you know, it's yeah, it's just not a real unit. But you can calculate it. So you take, uh, you take, uh, so you take. There's a hundred. Um, no, wait, there's a 3,600 seconds in an hour. And uh, so that means in one milli hour, there's going to be 3.6 seconds. So it's 80 milli, milli hours. So then yeah, 80 yeah, times and that. And, and then you calculate, you know, do the calculator. And then it was, I think it was something like four minutes and I don't calculate in my head, but... I think it was either three minutes or four minutes and six seconds and something like that. So you had to hold, you had to sit there. You're just sitting on a grass next uh, to this concrete block. 
in like it's in in middle of town basically <laughs> and uh, you're just sitting holding this button and uh and then you'll need to let it go at the right time which well maybe some people get it on the first go but i also didn't get that on the first <laughs> go because i just thought well you just have to hold the button for at least that time mm. and then you just let it go and the door will open so i was like well i'll give it a, some you know i'll give it some kind of margin of error i'll hold it a little longer and I let it go, you know, say if it was four minutes and six seconds, I let it go at four minutes and 10 seconds. And then I let it go and it just shows 82 oh. and nothing happens. So I went over the 80. So you have this 3.6 second window where you have to let the button go because wow. otherwise the door won't open. Mm. And so then you're sitting there again for four minutes holding the button and you get that 80 and the door opens. Wow. And then you get the then you actually get to the cache and get the logbook out. That's interesting. And 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 there and there was several, several like, you know, some yeah, there's there's another one that I remember was um it was called uh, I think the name of the cache was just something Estonian, but it was the hint of it was um the hint of it said something like uh blow but don't be a whistleblower or something like that and you you and it's a bird it looks like a birdhouse it's like it, that was in the woods that wasn't in the town and uh and it had all these little plastic tubes coming out of it and then you go and again there's a door but there's no obvious way how to open it and it's all you know looks pretty seamless and then you come to it and then you because it says something of blowing you just take one of the pipes and just like blow into it and then it gives like a some pitch of whistling sound and you, you take another pipe and you blow into it and it gives another pitch of whistling sound and then you go down to this rabbit hole trying to figure out oh maybe there's different pitches maybe i need to hold the other pipes closed and blow into it and then it turned out that was like all those pipes were a destruction and you actually there's a little kind of like little chimney on top of that birdhouse and it's a 3d printed thing where there's like a little cylinder inside that little chimney okay and you just have to blow and that cylinder is hollow from underneath and so the gap but you know it's all 3 3d printed and it's you know made so you can't fit anything in that gap to take that cylinder out but if you just blow into it because the cylinder is hollow the air like the air will get into it it will get into the hollow of the cylinder but then can't get out and then it just pushes it out yeah oh. and then it just so that's uh, yeah it's really amazing how you you know you just like lightly blow on it and it just lifts up that's and interesting. Uh, and again yeah then and then then you lift that up and then there was and there was another contraption below that that you had to it's one of those i don't know if you ever get those toys uh in us there were these jumping spiders with a little um tube attached and a little like a well i have um i have this which is like a, you know just a cleaner to blow uh electronics out but you know one of these kind of squeezy things at the at the one end and a little cable going to that spider and you do the squeezy thing and there's just like a little lip that you know kind of one of those you know those party things that you okay. blow into it and yeah. it goes Wee. yeah uh, and that's under the spider and then the spider kind of just jumps okay yeah i've seen um like a really simple toy yeah um, i've seen them with um like frogs I think it was and really... stuff here before yeah, yeah, yeah it was quite popular in the like early 2000s and 90s back home and uh, so it was one of those in there and you press the squeezy thing and that instead triggers something within the box to kind of unlock the latch from the inside. Okay. But yeah, yeah. And yeah, there was several, yeah, several of those kind of really cool caches there. So I think, you know, if I have to pick favorites, then yeah, I'll, I'll pick a Sony just because I've, I think proportionally from caches I have found, I have found uh, most like really creative and good caches in Estonia. Okay. 
I know that's so, yeah, always a, a hard visit. question to ask a favorite cash or favorite, you know, place to cash because especially when you've been cashing for so long, you, you see a lot and it's yeah. hard to pick yeah. favorites. Yeah, I mean, first time I saw those magnetic, um, you know, there's a little magnetic thing that magnetizes on a lamppost. Those those are relatively popular in New Zealand, but so it kind of blends in. But the first time I saw that, I was like, you know, super amazed, like, wow, you know, yeah. it's hidden in plain sight. All the muggles can see it, but, you know, it just looks like it's like a maintenance plate yeah. screwed onto the, onto the lamppost. But, you know, now I see it and I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I've, I've seen like hundreds of these. So, yeah, it's now it's kind of nothing special. It's kind of lost, <laughs> lost that, yeah, yeah, that appeal. Well, you have two cash highlights for us, uh, one for Latvia and one for New Zealand. So let's talk about the Latvia one first, and it's GC2B099, and it's called Message from Samuel. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's, uh, so it's a D5 mystery cache, and uh, I found it in 2010, so two years after I started geocaching, quite a while ago. And I'm not a big, uh, I'm not big on puzzles, um, so usually the most like, you know, the kind of harder mystery ones that I've found, I think probably most of them, I've just kind of tagged along with someone, like I haven't actually solved all of it. <laughs> uh, maybe I've helped with solving. Mostly I just help with physical finding, but, um, uh, that's a D5 one. I, I don't, might have even been the first one I did. Like that kind of completely, well, actually that was, that was still with, so with my best friend who figured it out. Um, I mean, who told me about geocaching, we were both kind of figuring that one out. So it was a collective effort, but we figured it out on our, on our own. I can't say I figured it on my own, but, uh, it was both of us and, um, and it's hidden by, yeah, there's this one geocache in Latvia. He only hides mysteries. Uh, okay. Like all of his hides, I think he's hidden like a hundred by this time, uh, by this point. And all of them are just quickly looking at his profile. Oh my God. Yeah. He's found 34,000. I think he's the, has the most finds in Latvia. Um, yeah, he has 130 hides. And out of those, not a single traditional one. Wow. He's in a mis mysteries, one letterbox, one virtual, and then some lab caches. And all of his mysteries are really creative, uh, and he and a lot of them are um, they're not hard. Maybe they're not hard, but they just a lot of them are low. Lots of local knowledge. Okay. Uh, so he'll post some. You know, you have to find the specific artwork somewhere in in town. And, you know, he'll give some vague hints about it. And I can just, like, it's really hard for locals to find them. And I can imagine if someone from abroad comes, like, they will have no clue. Like, you know, all of his mysteries will be like a D5 for for uh, foreign geocaches. Wow. Um, but, yeah, so this one message from Samuel, uh, that was, I think it was actually one of his, it was one of his first ones. And he's uh, he's an engineer of sorts. For a job, I think some sort of an electronics engineer. Okay. And so it's called message from Samuel. And then the description just says, you know, you won't, you won't find the cache of the coordinates and, uh, you know, just go to the posted coordinates. You'll see like a, basically it's, uh, like a building registration plate. Um, so in Latvia, just a really quick backstory, like, you know, you know, the address things on the house, mm -hmm. you know, like 61 blah, yeah. blah, blah street. So in Latvia, all of those are, they kind of serve as like a building passport as well. They will have other numbers on them. Like they will have like the entry in the official land registry and, you know, some other things oh, on, that, okay. on that official 
a house number plate. Like some historic information for the building, sort of? Not necessarily historic. Yeah, it's just kind of more for uh, like administrative purposes. Okay. But, you know, it makes um, it makes a good, uh, good soil for, um, you know, putting on those multi uh, caches or mystery caches where you have to visit the point and read some numbers. Okay. Because they're not going to be numbers because the street number, you can easily Google seen street view, but those tiny right. numbers there, no way you can see them in street view you can't google them really and so yeah you know it just says go to the point read these numbers and then uh, next you need to go to the point on the opposite side of the street in the distance of you know you calculated the number the distance and the degrees and to get the samuel's message at this place you will need to use a popular technical device and then additional useful information how to use the device is 123.0591 minus uh, the C, which is just the num one of the numbers you got meters. So it, it you know, translates to like 3.0591 meters. And that's kind of it. And then it just says, well, additional hint is this tool was first uh, thought to be invented on May 7, 1895. And so this again, this was 2010. So, well, I think the first iPhone was out by that time, but you know, nobody had smartphones at that point. Right. So, yeah. And so basically we figured out, so that the, those meters that hint 3.0591, it's like a really specific amount of meters, right? It's a really specific distance. Yeah. And, um, so it turns out it's a wavelength. Okay. So you need you need a radio wave receiving device, you know, just a portable radio. And you tune it to and that just turns out to 98 megahertz. Uh, you know, if you do that wavelength in, in megahertz. And yeah, and so you go to this corner of the building, put your radio on 98 megahertz, and then you're getting this message, which is Morse code. And the inventor of Morse code was Samuel Morse, so that's why it's a message from Samuel. Oh. And uh, and and there's a bit of a debate because I actually looked this up on the internet, and uh, so 1895, May 7, because uh, uh, it's yeah, there's there's kind of, I think in the in the you know and the radio enthusiasts will have uh, you know would have things to say about this because. Uh, People in U.S. will definitely say that the radio was invented at another time by another pe by another person. But uh, in uh, kind of, I think that was the Imperial Russian times. Uh, they had this guy who kind of invented the first. He, he was like some like lightning receiver. He made basically he made a va radio wave receiver. He couldn't transmit anything. Oh, okay. But he could receive. Is, and so he could detect lightning strikes from like 40 kilometers away. Oh, wow. But then, you know, like not long after, I think it was like a French guy and maybe, you know, because I think in US it's mostly, what's it, Nicola? No, was it Edison? Or, you know, somebody who actually invented like a radio receiver and transmitted and transmitted yeah. the first voice message or something you know that's happened in us some a little bit later but yeah and so then yeah we, i think i i think i was actually we were using my old trusty mp3 player again because it had a radio it had a radio and it could record of the radio so we okay. recorded the message and then uh you know because nowadays uh, you all, again. You, you, if you have a Morse message, you just kind of chuck it in an online converter or something, and you know just spews out the numbers. But we actually, you know, we went home with this recording, and then we were sitting at a sitting at a desk and just like put it on speaker, and then just were like noting down the Mor Morse code, and then the the coding the Morse code on paper. And wow. uh, yeah, so it was like a real exciting. You know, a real exciting thing when we actually get the coordinates, and then it turns out uh, he's hidden. There was a whole backstory about it that so he wanted to hide the cache next to these two short wave, old shortwave radio towers. Okay. But you know, by all the time it took him like to program the 
transmitter and set the cache up and everything. And then when everything was ready, his work colleagues sent him a message saying, oh, well, you know that they are going to blow up these two old towers because they're you know, disused oh. and uh, they're just going to blow them up and take them away for scrap. And uh, so he still hid the cache to, next to the place where they were. But when, you know, when we went to find the cache, there was no towers there. I think there might have been one of them might still be lying down. Okay. Like it, it might have still been there, but just like, yeah, the base of it was blown up and it was. Wow. But yeah, I, I thought, yeah, and I have, well, it was my milestone number 900. Like that was my 900 found cash. So yeah, and, and it's one of those that kind of stuck in my memory. That sounds, uh, from, that's definitely, yeah, that, I can yeah. see why it's a difficulty five. Because that there's a lot of yeah, work there's a lot, whole lot of one. things involved. Yeah, 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 it sounds really interesting though. But yeah, it's it's disabled at the moment. Yeah, I think as uh, yeah, there's both. He's had both some issues, and you know, it's been up for more than ten years. So uh, yeah, the, the, there's been some changes now, both in the place where he set the initial coordinates up and in the final location. Mm. So hopefully, hopefully he'll he's able to renew it. Hopefully. It, it sounds it's always sad to hear when a cache that has so much creativity and effort put into it has to be archived so hopefully they'll be able to yeah, get that yeah. that back yeah service. it's that's why it's really i i just really like the geotour caches yeah you know they have like a limited lifespan but there's so much work that goes into them and then they just you know get taken off yeah yeah, the, that's like the yeah, if there was one is, thing I yeah. would be able to influence ground speak with, I would tell them, you know, like, sure, you know, stop the all the other things around that geo tour, you know, you won't have all the backing. But if the cash owners are happy to just maintain the caches after, just keep them, you know, keep them up, keep them running. Yeah, that'd be nice if even if you can't, even if they have to rename them or something and make them no longer. Yeah, maybe uh, rename them. Yeah. Because I've seen it with this last geo tour here in New Zealand because it was hidden just by, you know, just by cashers. They were approached by the Ministry of Education mm -hmm. and then they kind of, you know, made a plan and all that. But when the geo tour ended, they all have to be archived. But some of the cash owners just decided, you know, they they did have the liberty to reinstate just publish a new cache using just the same information and same cache spot okay but i kind of yeah i just don't like that um you know it's kind of you know there's this you just republishing the same cache yeah like uh, in that case you know why just not let the old one you know keep running the same same listing yeah if you're just republishing you know, there's, the exact there's same reasons thing there's and, probably yeah probably reasons logistics of some kind i'm sure yeah and uh yeah so i guess then i have the new zealand cache that i chose yes and that is gc3 jk37 tour de taylor four tour de taylor four yeah and so that in turn oh actually i just realized so that's so the latvian one was a d5 t2 and this one is d2 t5 <laughs> so this is a terrain five cache um which is on top of a mountain and the altitude is 2333 meters the decent and hike it's, it's one of the highest geocaches in new zealand it's not the very highest but it is the highest in south island okay um so we have a couple of mountains in the north island with caches on them that are higher but not much higher, but this is the highest in South Island, even though South Island has the actual New Zealand highest mountain. But again, as I told you before, yeah, there's no caches on Mount Cook because that's just too, it's too dangerous. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it would be, you know, if you're not an actual mountaineer, you'll never go there probably. So, um, yeah, and this one's, uh, this one's, uh, one of my really memorable ones and it's one that gets fine gets found really seldom uh it's hidden in may 2012 and since then it's found six times oh wow 
Um, so yeah, I was actually, yeah, I found it four years ago. And uh, yeah, it was a, it was a big hike. Uh, you go stay at a hut that's kind of at the base of the mountain. You have a two, wo two hour walk into the hut and then you just stay overnight. And then the next time, next day you get up early, hike up and hike back down to the hut. And um, you're probably too exhausted to walk back to the car. So you stay at the hut another, another night. And uh, it's really weather dependent. Like you have to have kind of perfect weather to be walking up there because right. um, if it's raining, you can't go up because the first part of the hike is actually going up stream bed. Oh. And it's a, it's a relatively small stream. Like you'll have to jump across it several times as you, as you hike up. But if it has been raining, that stream turns into a river. So it's like a raging oh, wow. river coming down from a mountain. Okay. So you absolutely can't go up there if it's raining. Well, if it has been raining like the previous night or day. And, um, and it's all, yeah, the landscape up there. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I can't share my screen. But um, anyway, you know, it's you can look up the GC code. I have some pictures up there. It's just rocks. It's like these scree slopes and there's nothing, there's no vegetation. There's nothing living there. It's like, a, you know, you feel like you're on Mars or something. Cause um, yeah, it's all you see is like rocky, rocky kind of barren uh, landscape around you. And, um, and it's a really, yeah, it's a prominent mountain. It's uh, so yeah, you start from the hut, the elevation of the hut is about 700 meters. So okay. you have about 1,500 meters of altitude to, to overcome to get to the top. Wow. And yeah, that, and there's no marked trail or anything. So you're just kind of following a, following a ridge line. You're following the stream bed in the beginning. Then you get on a ridge line and you just follow the ridge line up. Um, and there's, it's sort of tail of four because there's four total caches along the way but so that one's on the top that's why it's called tour de Taylor four and it's called mount taylor that's the name of the mountain okay and yeah but it's the nothing nothing uh particular about the cache itself but it's just that getting there the the planning, adventure uh, the the experience the adventure yeah 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 definitely i bet that's quite and that's actually yeah yeah when you once you actually get on that ridge line up up above, yeah, then you see, then you can see all around like 360 views because, yeah, that's the highest mountain in the closest, you know, closest like 100 kilometer radius. Yeah. And, uh, oh, actually, yeah, if you've seen, because I've sent you a message through geocaching, my cover picture on geocaching profile, that's actually from that. It's, uh, oh, is it? It's the one where I have like a circle, I have a circle saying I'm here, and then you just, uh, where I'm like a tiny dot, and then there's I have a circle of the geocache, which is up on the up on the hill, okay. up on the top of the peak. Yeah, I saw the your image. I wasn't quite sure. Yeah, yeah. I figured so it was something you know identifying. Because I went there with a few that... friends, and uh, like two of us went all the way up to the peak, and then two others stayed behind yeah because they were just kind of over the mountain and they... <laughs> <laughs> it was hard so yeah they just kind of stayed there and uh, so that's why yeah they, they were able to take the picture with us in the distance and i actually hid a geocache there up there as well oh. like about maybe 200 meters below the peak okay and i hid it on that hike that we did in 2019 and i can proudly say that the ftf is finally fallen on it this year oh really uh, so it was four years for the first to find her wow yeah, yeah. those yeah. those i mean that's and it's a, yeah, it's a, a relatively close like it's a, it's just a two-hour drive from uh, from the city so it's not that far but it's the the hike it's itself just getting out. is it like an all day like you just plan all day to go up and down the mountain yeah, yeah i mean i've read you know you know from those six logs one is mine and the five other people who have found the cache you know i kind of i'm reading in their logs oh yeah you know i was uh you know i left the hut at 7 30 i was at the summit by lunchtime 
you know, and then I got back down. But yeah, it really it will be super dependent on your level of fitness. Right. You know, like it took us because there were four of us, and uh, you know, I've been hiking maybe more than you know maybe an average person, but you know, two of two of our friends were you know they were just kind of recently got into hiking, and then I took them on this big hike. That I think <laughs> put them off for some <laughs> quite some time um but yeah you, you know we were slow so we were slow to go up so it took us a full like 13 hours to go up and back to the hut wow including you know like lunch breaks yeah and there a lot of rest breaks in in between wow and it got super windy like up on that ridge line when we were coming down the wind was so that's another thing. Yeah, it's like the weather was starting to turn when we were coming down. But yeah, no, luckily we were already coming down by that point. But it did start raining and the wind was like, it's that, you know, when it rains and then the rain is like needles in your face. Okay. Uh, because the wind's so strong. Oh, wow. And um, yeah, it's definitely an adventure. I... And again, because wow. of the demographics, it's, you know, it's one of the reasons why the cash doesn't those caches don't get found often right i imagine if you you get up there without anything to any kind of vegetation to break the wind it can get pretty dangerous rather quickly if you're up there on that ridge and the, the wind starts blowing yeah yeah i mean it's not yeah you know it's it's still a fairly you know it's a ridge line like that it's not like a cliff face right. where you're walking next to a cliff where you know if you stumble and fall you know you fall to your death kind of thing mostly you know right. for most of the it's it's a ridge line you know if you 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 can you know if you you know you might roll a little bit on on the rocks and you still hurt yourself but you know it won't be lethal it, it's not gonna <laughs> but, be uh, fun though you know, obviously it's, <laughs> it's not gonna be fun and uh yeah um i mean that's what i wrote in my cash description you know like really you know you have to know your limits and uh you know you have to really kind of sense you know like just you know common sense yeah. if you're going there or not going there because so yeah on my cash uh so yeah the ftf was this year but there had been there had been attempts in the okay. in those past four years there have been a couple of attempts of people where you know somebody walked went to the hut was all prepared to go and then they got rained on like they couldn't they just couldn't walk up or there was one geocacher who sprained their ankle Ooh. and they just couldn't, uh, yeah. Uh, so they just couldn't proceed then. Or, you know, some who were just like planning but never get around to it. Um, yeah. But yeah, so yeah, I chose that. Yeah, because again, yeah, that's really mem memorable, not because of the cash itself, but yeah, just that, just that adventure. Yeah. And yeah, and it's, well, you know, it's, you can't, not everyone will be able to do it. Like it's, it's objectively, yeah, cash not for everyone. Yeah. You're... Again, yeah. I mean, if you have, you know, if you have a helicopter. <laughs> Repel uh, down out of the helicopter and you, grab you it. Can, yeah, you can get it uh, in any, you know, if in any physical condition, but then you have to have that helicopter yeah it sounds like you're definitely earning that uh that t5 rating on that one for oh sure. yeah I've, I've earned the badge yeah <laughs> yeah and uh i did recently so my last uh, our last trip was to mexico uh we went uh just end of last year and then i, I filled that altitude cache badge oh okay because uh, you know because that's again that's a funny thing because in new zealand if you're anywhere up one thousand more than 1000 meters elevation that means you know you've hiked yeah there's i think the highest road in new zealand well highest sealed road you know not excluding some like gravel tracks or something like that okay highest sealed road is about 900 meters of elevation so you know you can go there and then easily kind of hike up to 1000 meters and that's fine but then you know usually if you're anywhere above 1000 meters you've done a hike Whereas Mexico, the city of uh, city of Mexico itself is 2,000 meters elevation. So, you know, you're just finding 2,000 meter elevation caches in parking lots. Yeah. Uh, it was also, yeah, it was uh, my friend. 
he's from the states he's living in new zealand and he recently went back to to the states to and he he went to visit new mexico and he said the same thing you know yeah, I just pulled up in a you know shop parking lot, found a cache, two thousand one hundred meters elevation. <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's Picked. it's all about just the the landscape. Yeah. But then and, I know. I did some I did some hikes in Mexico, and then I went I got to the four thousand five hundred uh four thousand five hundred badge. Wow, uh, happy happy to get that. <laughs> it was literally the cache was four thousand five hundred. 30 something like it was just above that uh you know next uh, next step wow yeah and you can't get that oh, yeah. in new that's, zealand that's well yeah that that's the thing yeah i've always kind of been drawn to you know hiking in mountains and stuff and i come from a country where there's none of it you know in latvia <laughs> the highest cash you can get is 300 meters so wow you have to go you have to travel to 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 get to the mountains but i think that's uh yeah my parents when i was uh like in the early 2000s uh when i was still like younger my parents like usually we would go in summer once a year we would go somewhere in europe to do some like hikes in the mountains like slovenia slovakia uh poland and i think that kind of triggered something in me so I've always it's one of the reasons why I'm, all, uh, why, why I'm happy to live in new zealand of the mountains okay yeah well i think uh you're starting to look increasingly sleepy because <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's 11 p.m it's right? 11 p.m here yeah, yeah. <laughs> you notice that huh <laughs> what what was it is it a 15 hour time difference 16 uh no, I think it's uh, was it seventeen? Because yeah, I, I it's it's four p.m. now. Okay. On a Saturday. Okay. So yeah, seventeen yeah, so 17 hours. Seventeen yeah. hours. Yeah, that's. <laughs> hmm. That's you know it's that's one thing about being able to do a Zoom or video chat like this is amazing because you can talk to people all over the world, but you've got to account for that time difference and yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. it gets a little crazy Definitely. but it's especially yeah if in, you're in one of those extremes yeah like new zealand's pretty far uh you know in the times of time zones it... um yeah the rest of the yeah you're out there a little bit western countries <laughs> And it's funny because the chatham islands their time zone is 45 minutes ahead of new zealand so it's not even like a you know it's not an hour minutes. it's not a half an hour it's 45 minutes wow. so the time difference is weird there wow but that means they claim so the chatham islands you know they have the slogan like first to see the sun because on every new year's day they would be the you know they would get the new year first right and so there's some, you know, there's people who specially travel to Chatham Islands to see that first sunset. 45 minutes. Wow. I don't, I hadn't, I never realized that, that I'm used to time zones being by hours. I never realized there was one that was yeah. less than an hour. There, there are, there's, there's actually a few, around, like there's not many, it's, you know, it's an exception rather than a rule, but right. there are other like. I think half an hour time zones. Yeah, there's a, quite a few around the world, but yeah, there's, there's half hour like seems those... it half hour reasonable. makes a little more yeah. sense than a than forty five minutes. Yeah, but it... those fifteen minutes and forty five minutes. Yeah, I think there might only be two of those. One is Chatham Islands, and the other one there was another one somewhere. I think in wow. Pacific. It's those you know like those tiny islands that are kind of yeah they are far from the closest actual like the full hour time zone yeah and but they're not far enough to be in the next hour and then right. they just kind of you know decide oh well you know we'll we're gonna have a 15 minute difference That's... but you know I, I can't think of how you know that because that just makes everything confusing that is you know confusing. with hours you can deal with hours when you're doing meetings and, and stuff like that you know you're yeah. doing just like solid hour but if you need to calculate like 45 minute difference yeah that would make things yeah, a bit a more complicated but 
but I live on island time anyway. That's that's a <laughs> saying. Uh, they, they don't time doesn't really exist there. You're just living by the you're just living by the tides and by the weather. Yeah. And on those small islands, like I've been to Cook Islands as well. Like okay. you know, there's that saying saying island time there. Uh, yeah, you know, if you want yeah, you know, you're arranging a meeting with someone or something, you're meeting somewhere, you know, it's gonna be really relaxed, like no one's they may not yeah, even show it's, up. It's, like it's so laid back. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's none of this kind of Western, you know. A schedule, schedule. You know, everyone's rushing around. Oh wow. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for for joining me on the podcast and and talking about your experience with with Latvia and New Zealand. It's it's always interesting to hear what other places are like, especially when, you know, not everybody's able to travel around the world so much. So I really appreciate you taking the time to, to join me for that today. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, yeah, it was, uh, it was fun. You've been listening to geocache adventures with me, shadow dragon one. If you'd like to get in touch, you can reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram, or go to geocacheadventures.org and you can find the information on the contact page. Theme music is by The Travel Bugs. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Have you heard of FTF Magazine? It's the magazine for geocachers. It is full of articles and pictures all submitted by geocachers just like you. I'm a subscriber myself and I love it. My favorite part is the little snippets on the edges of the articles on all the different pages. Those are my favorites. Just go to ftfgeo.com to check them out and tell them Shadow Dragon 1 sent you. 